You can't talk community development without talking about churches and mosques and temples and synagogues. You just can't talk about it because they are the community. So my challenge uh, to you is, can we not all get along? What are the global giants in the world? What are the problems that affect billions of people, not millions? The vehicle to bring about Drucker's vision of a new society is Rick Warren's peace plan. Warren unveiled his purpose-driven peace plan in Angel Stadium before 30,000 church members on April 17, 2005. When he announced it, first they kicked off with Purple Haze. Rick Warren singing, you know, Purple Haze in my brain, you know, Jimi Hendrix's song about LSD. Jimi Hendrix talks about how he was possessed and songs just came out of him, you know. And here we're singing a song, and not, not me, but, you know, these guys are singing this song, Rick Warren leading with his band backing him uh, about Purple Haze and, you know, back to the 60s and that whole mentality of the age of Aquarius. And here he announces his peace plan. When I studied and read uh, Rick Warren's Global Peace Plan that he launched at the stadium in California with the song, of Jimi Hendrix song, there was nothing in that song about the gospel. Why would you want to launch a global peace plan with a pagan or an atheist, or, or, or where there's the lyrics of which have nothing to do with the gospel? In introducing his peace plan, Warren said, My hope is for a new reformation in the church and a new spiritual awakening throughout the world. Warren also believes that the popularity of his book, The Purpose Driven Life, is an indication of this new reformation in Christianity. He stated, I believe that we are possibly on the verge of a new reformation in Christianity and another great awakening in our nation. The signs are everywhere, including the popularity of this book. But what is this new reformation, this new spiritual awakening associated with Saddleback's peace plan and Drucker's new society? In 1982, Robert Schuller issued a call for a new reformation in his book, Self-Esteem, The New Reformation. Then in 1999, C. Peter Wagner announced a new apostolic reformation in his book, Churchquake. But I want to remind you that the new apostolic reformation is the most radical change in the way of doing church since the Protestant Reformation. That's what we're, that's what we're dealing with. That's what we're springing off into the 21st century with. Now Rick Warren is calling for yet another new reformation based on his peace plan to wipe out the global problems and make the church relevant to unbelievers. Rick Warren later changed the P in his peace acrostic from planting churches to promote reconciliation. For example, listen to his speech before an audience of Muslims who would have found the idea of planting Christian churches offensive. On page 48 of Brian McLaren's book, Everything Must Change, he speaks in favor of Warren's peace plan. McLaren says, Under the banner of a five-point peace plan, Warren called local churches to participate in a second reformation. This first reformation, led by Martin Luther, Warren explains, was about belief. This one will be about deeds. It is about what the church should be doing in the world. Many of you know Rick Warren, the well-known pastor from Southern California. Uh, and, and I was so impressed. You know, Rick wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Life that sold. It broke all kinds of sales records. I don't know how many gazillion it sold, but it, it really has been incredible. It was an incredibly significant publication. Now, what would really be interesting when someone writes a book called The Purpose Driven Life and they, they suddenly get huge amounts of money and fame and influence coming their way, then it'll be interesting to watch how does the author use all that fame, money, and influence, you know? What, you'll really see what his purpose is at that point. Not just what he writes about, but how he lives. And you know what Rick did with all of that fame and power and influence that came his way? He said, we've got to get people concerned about global crises. He came up with a list of five. If you know Rick, you know it would be in an acrostic, P-E-A-C-E. -E. Uh, per Warren discussed his peace plan as follows. When Jesus sent the disciples into a village, he said, Find the man of peace. 
And he said, when you find the man of peace, you start working with that person. And if they respond to you, you work with them. If they don't, you dust off your shoes, you go to the next village. Who's the man of peace in any village? Or it might be a woman of peace who has the most respect. They're open and they're influential. They don't have to be a Christian. In fact, they could be a Muslim. But they're open and they're influential and you work with them to attack the five giants. And that's going to bring the second reformation. Do you want to work with this on poverty, disease, AIDS, illiteracy, injustice? I often find people are more unwilling to work with us than we are willing to work with them. In other words, we're saying, you don't have to change your beliefs for us to work with you. If you can only work with people that you agree with, then most of the world you're ruling out. Right. Okay? I don't insist that a Muslim change his belief for me to work on poverty. I don't even insist that a a gay person has to change their beliefs. They're not going to accept my belief, or I'm not going to accept theirs, but I just met with the... When I'm out working on trying to stop AIDS, I'll work with an atheist, I'll work with a gay person, I'll work with somebody who totally disagrees with me. If they want to work on an issue, fine, why? We're building a bridge. Warren's peace plan includes unbelievers. Muslims, homosexuals, etc., setting aside differences and working together to fight poverty, disease, AIDS, illiteracy, and injustice. This, according to Warren, will bring about the Second Reformation. Thus, Warren's Reformation is a social reformation rather than a spiritual one. And so the Reformation needs to be about what we, what we do, not what we say we do. In conjunction with his peace plan, Rick Warren is promoting the three-legged stool, a concept introduced by Peter Drucker as a means to bring together different sectors in society. Drucker believed that the only way to persuade the world to accept change was to engage the public sector of effective government, the private sector of effective business, and the social sector of effective community organizations, including nonprofit faith-based organizations. Over the last two years, I've spent a lot of time flying around meeting with every country we go into. We meet with the government leaders, we meet with the business leaders, and we meet, we meet with the pastors. We train the pastors, but we also meet with these other legs of the stool so that they understand they have to bring the church to the table. Uh, there's a role for uh, the public sector, there's a role for the private sector, and there's a role for the faith sector. Each of them can do something that, that none of the other three can do. Can we not work together uh, in building the three legs of the stool. For the last three years, I've been working on a prototype of this. It's called the Peace Plan, P-E-A-C-E. -E. Promote reconciliation, equip ethical leaders, assist the poor, care for the sick, educate the next generation. Peter Drucker, when he got involved with the mega churches, he came to recognize that one of the easiest things to put together, of course, as we understand, is the a world economic system. And we're about there now. That's the easiest part of the stool to get together in a one world order. The second part is the governance of, of that. That's more difficult. And it takes the crises to develop that. And then you take advantage of the crises that is created. But the most difficult is how in the world do you get the heart of these people? My feeling, of course, is that third leg of the stool is the last leg to be developed, and that will be a religious leg, a religion that is man-made and not God-made. If you are a global business leader, you need to understand that the future of the world is not secularism. It is religious pluralism. You may not like that, but you're going to have to deal with it. Warren's Reformation has little to do with preaching the gospel, but much to do with all religions setting aside their differences in order to solve global problems. The person over here who asked about uh, the millennial goals, I, I met last month with uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon uh, to talk about faith-based organizations working with the UN on this. And later you should talk to Tony Blair, who's just formed a foundation. He's much too humble to talk about it on this very issue. 
to my brother, Islamic brother here from Italy, I would say, I'm not really interested in interfaith dialogue. I'm interested in interfaith projects. We got enough talk. Notice how Warren's peace plan is distinctly different than Jesus' peace plan. In Warren's project, Christians and Muslims are equally yoked together in ministry, whereas Jesus said, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Jesus' peace plan brings a sword of division between Christians and those hostile to the gospel, such as Muslims, so that a man's foes shall be those of his own household. This sword that Jesus spoke of was his word and the gospel that would divide households once allegiances were made to his kingdom. While Warren's plan is seeking to bring about interfaith peace and world peace, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. Jesus came to bring peace with God through repentance and faith in him, not world peace, as Warren's peace plan achieves. Just as Drucker criticized Christianity for being too individualistic, the church growth movement seeks to appeal to unbelieving people groups collectively. Paul Smith writes, The Fuller School of World Missions founding dean, Donald McGavern, introduced a new theory. He advocated that missionaries should not make a gospel appeal for a response from an individual, but elicit responses from groups of people. This new missional theory appealed to unbelieving homogenous people groups to collectively agree to abandon their old religion, identify with Christ, claim the Bible as their authority, claim the church as their religious institution. An entire people group or society being Christianized cannot be equated with individuals one by one being born again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him uh, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever believeth, it's an individual matter. It's individually coming to Jesus. But in fulfillment of Drucker's lifelong goal of creating a new society through the megachurch, Time magazine reported, over the last four years, Warren has beta-tested his plan by sending almost 8,000 members of his own 22,000-member Saddleback Church congregation and an undetermined number from 12 other congregations to work in 68 nations. The flagship project has been in Rwanda, whose president has declared his intentions to make his country the world's first purpose-driven nation. Simply called the Peace Plan, this ambitious effort takes Warren's purpose-driven philosophies to new heights. Rwanda became the first nation to sign up, thanks in large part to the country's president, Paul Kagame, and his unique relationship with Pastor Warren. This next step involves bringing the country's three sectors of society together to work on developing the country. The, the component of faith and Christianity government and business. Success here means this peace model may one day be replicated in other countries. A possible goal is 68 other countries and Saddleback Church has sent out nearly 8,000 members in small teams around the world. I want to tell you I'm more excited about uh, Purpose Driven and the Peace Plan than I've ever been because I saw an amazing result. In what, I'm watching an entire nation being transformed because of you, Saddleback Church. The president was flat out overjoyed. I spent two days with the president's advisory council, which I serve on. I spoke to a national prayer breakfast to about 400 of the leading government leaders. There was great enthusiasm. In fact, they've asked me to train their leadership. I had private meetings with the, uh, the president of the central bank, the governor of the central bank, and the prime minister, of course, with the president. Uh, and these men have asked me to do leadership training uh, for that nation with the government because they've seen what's happened with our pastors. This idea of a purpose-driven nation or purpose-driven country or purpose-driven society is no different than Emperor Constantine's intentions with the Holy Roman Empire. In the early 4th century AD, Constantine adopted the Christian faith for the entire Roman Empire. Constantine declared that the Roman world is now Christian.
Christianizing a nation, an entire society, proved to be a fatal mistake. After Constantine's declaration, Christianity was mixed with the empire's existing secular beliefs and holidays, causing confusion which remains today. As Rick Warren launched the Purpose Driven Living in Uganda campaign, the following press release also spoke of the Purpose Driven Country and the Purpose Driven Continent. Pastor Rick has partnered with the President and others to make Rwanda a Purpose Driven Country. I ask, why not Uganda as well? Archbishop Arombi challenged an unprecedented gathering of 450 national leaders at a banquet gathered to hear Dr. Warren speak. Uganda should be a purpose driven nation as well. But it takes people of purpose to build purpose driven churches, purpose driven communities, and a purpose driven country. Someday we will have a purpose driven continent. You know, we told uh, the Rwandans about. Our next goal, now that we've gone to every nation, we're now going to go to the 3,800 unengaged people groups, these small tribes that don't have a, uh, any church in it between now and the end of the decade. While Warren's plan for changing and reaching the world are very noble, it is dreadful to think that the watered-down, easy-believism version of the gospel is not only being spread all over the world, but now going to be proclaimed to unreached people groups of the world. Hi, I'm Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church in Southern California and author of The Purpose Driven Church and The Purpose Driven Life. I want to talk to you about something that's deeply embedded in my heart and maybe it's embedded in yours. If you care about taking the whole gospel to the whole world in a whole new way, I want to talk to you for just a minute. In an article entitled, Rick Warren in Rwanda announces plans to host all 54 African nations at Purpose Driven Church Congress, the Christian Post reports, Pastor Rick Warren announces plans for the All Africa Purpose Driven Church Congress to be held in August 6th through 10th, 2015. The report continues, the conference will be the first of five annual continent-wide conferences to take place by 2020, with the second plan to be held in Latin America in 2016. This conference will be held in Rwanda, the first purpose-driven nation. Warren explained how the idea for the peace plan was birthed in 2003, but it became a reality as Rwanda became the first purpose-driven nation. Warren said, most nations are validated by their strength in exports. Rwanda can become famous for exporting leadership. Rwanda should be the leadership and innovation capital of the continent of Africa. That is why I am calling leaders from across the continent to come to Rwanda next year to learn. The strength of Rwanda is not in the ground, it's in the people. Rick Warren is pointing to Rwanda as the model for the entire continent of Africa. In other words, the country, which became the first purpose-driven nation, is now Warren's model for what he hopes will be the first purpose-driven continent. Pastor Rick Warren cast the following vision for the year 2015. Now let me tell you about a couple of opportunities we've got coming up in our church in 2015 since this is Vision Weekend. Paul says there's a wide open door for a great work here. We have just been given a wide open door like no other church in the history of Christianity. An opportunity to impact an entire continent. Let me give you the background. We started the peace plan about 10 years ago to promote reconciliation and plant churches, to equip leaders, to assist the poor, to care for the sick, to educate the next generation. Over the next 10 years, we sent out 23,869 of our members to 197 nations. Nobody has ever done that, ever, anywhere, in 2,000 years of Christianity. This is the most global-minded church on the planet, bar none, bar none. One of those 197 countries was a little nation called Rwanda, only 10 million people had been devastated by a genocide 20 years ago when a million people were killed. The president of that country, Pastor, uh, President Paul Kagame, read my book, Purpose Driven Life. And he wrote me a letter and he says, I read Purpose Driven Life, I'm a man of purpose. I invite you to come and help us rebuild our nation, help us become the first purpose driven nation. 
bring the peace plan, bring, bring your training. And so while we were sending 23,000 members to every nation, we made a concerted effort to send 1,200 of our members to this little country called Rwanda. And we began to train them in everything possible to help them rebuild. We first started with the churches, working in and through the churches. Over 4,000 churches, 3,000, 4,000 churches have gone through purpose-driven training. Over 2,000 of them have completed three years of training. These churches are growing, they're caring for the sick, they're assisting the poor, they're helping educate the next generation. They're doing things that the government had neither the money nor the expertise to do. Now, when this started happening in Rwanda, I started getting calls first from other business leaders, other church leaders, other African leaders, and then I started getting calls from the presidents of nations. I've had five African presidents call me and say, when are you bringing the peace plan to our nation? And I said, well, we're not, but we'll send the Rwandans. Because we'll train them to train others, to train others, to train others. So then I got the idea, well, what about instead of us going to them, why don't we bring them all in to Rwanda? So a month ago, I invited the top leaders of 35 nations, 31 African nations, and leaders from Russia, from China, from India, and from the United States. 35 nations invited them to go with me to Rwanda to see this national miracle of a purpose-driven nation and the purpose and the peace plan. And we, we took them, I, I let them see how we work with business leaders, and I took them a lot of them to see how we work with government leaders, and I took them to let them see how we work with educational leaders, and of course I let them see, most of all, how we're working through the churches, the church is the center of the community. And every one of these leaders said, we're going back to our nation to plan a steering committee for a purpose-driven peace plan strategy national, nationwide in our nation. So next year, in August, we're gonna hold the first All Africa Continental Congress for purpose-driven leadership in Rwanda. They've just got a new convention center finished. And we're gonna bring the top leaders from all 54 African nations together. And we're gonna train them in how to do PD, purpose-driven, and the peace plan. Notice this is not about bringing the gospel or Jesus to other nations, but bringing the peace plan to other nations. Working with business leaders, government leaders, and educational leaders has nothing to do with the Great Commission. In the Great Commission, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Warren mentions assisting the poor, caring for the sick, and educating the next generation, which are all meaningful ministries. But he omits the preaching of the gospel, making disciples, and teaching them to observe all things Jesus commanded. Warren's peace plan is not a fulfillment of the Great Commission. So in 2015, I'm going to host an All Africa purpose-driven church leadership training conference in the heart of the continent of Africa in Kigali, Rwanda. Unlike Saddleback Church, the church described in the Bible never yoked itself with government and business in order to change the globe through humanitarian efforts. The kingdom of Christ and his church is not an earthly political kingdom of this world. It is separate from the world and the affairs of the state. With worldly nations like Rwanda and Uganda becoming purpose-driven nations through the peace plan, the Apostle John tells us, They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. James 4.4 4 declares, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Yet Warren's peace plan and new society envisioned by his mentor Peter Drucker is increasingly embraced by politicians, celebrities, and world leaders. 
He was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, which the Council on Foreign Relations is seeking to build a new world order. And at first he just blatantly denied that he was a member of the CFR. And then later it came out that, yeah, he was a member and admitted that he is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. So his peace plan is, is, is very, very uh, scary as it fits into the this whole ecumenical movement, this whole God's dream, kingdom, dominion, new world order, and where the church is headed at this time. Even President Obama sparked controversy when he asked Rick Warren to lead the prayer at the presidential inauguration in January of 2009. After Warren began his speech, he said these words. The scripture tells us, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. And you are the compassionate and merciful one. And you are loving to everyone you have made. Warren appeals to the three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. The first half of the paragraph, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, is the Shema from Deuteronomy 6.5, the most notable prayer in Judaism. But a problem arises when Warren says, You are the compassionate and merciful one. Yes, God is compassionate, and yes, God is merciful. But you won't find these attributes grouped together like this anywhere in the Bible. You will find them, however, consistently scattered throughout the Quran. In fact, 113 chapters, all except one, begin with, In the name of Allah, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Other translations translate this phrase as entirely merciful, the especially merciful, or most gracious, most compassionate. Regardless of how this Arabic expression is translated, merciful and compassionate are consistently grouped together throughout the Quran and attributed to Allah, but never do they appear in this way in regard to Yahweh in the Bible. Then you have Rick Warren at Barack Obama's you know, inaugural prayer, doing the inaugural prayer, and he's praying in the name of Isa at one point. I humbly ask this in the name of the one who changed my life, Yeshua. Isa, Jesus, Jesus. Nisa is, is not the Jesus of the Bible. Isa is the Jesus of the Quran, which is a different Jesus, again, who didn't die for our sins and who is not God in the flesh, is not the Son of God. Uh, and then you have him also addressing the ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America. <laughs> which just couple years prior to that was designated by the Justice Department as as a terrorist group or funding terrorism and he doesn't give them the gospel so we say well yeah, he came to preach Jesus to them you know and hey you know praise God I'd, I'm all for standing up at the gates of hell and proclaiming the gospel that would be awesome but that's not what happened he encourages them on how to be successful uh, now <laughs> when you look at what Islam teaches about ultimate success in the Quran is the domination over every other religion of Islam by Islam through the use of jihad and if you're you know going out you're against your enemy and slaying him wherever you find him and and Christians are allowed to live as long as they submit to Islam and, and pay pay the toll tax you know uh, otherwise they're persecuted they're beheaded uh, so it's getting really sad as to where this is all headed because these are the leaders of the visible professing church working with Muslims to bring this new world order about. I was asked to speak to you about how can Muslims and Christians work closer together for the greater good in our world. And I will tell you that I'm not interested in interfaith dialogue. I am interested in interfaith projects. There's a big difference. Warren gave practical examples of how Muslims and Christians could work together on his peace plan. Christians are to boldly proclaim the gospel to Muslims, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in Jesus' name, rather than trying to find a common word with them or common ground in order to work for the common good. The gospel of Jesus Christ was absent from Warren's entire speech. Now, dear friends, as globalization draws us closer and closer together, one of the most pressing questions we have to ask ourselves is how do we deal with our deepest differences? It is a fundamental question we have to wrestle with. How do we live together in peace and harmony? 
And not only that, how can we actually work together, maintaining our separate traditions, maintaining our convictions without compromise, but working together for the greater good of everybody in the world? In this statement, is not Warren essentially stating that the convictions of Muslims are fine and worth maintaining without compromise or being challenged? Jesus said, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Who is a liar but he that denies the Son? Christ-rejecting Muslims are enemies of God, but Rick Warren believes they can contribute to the greater good of humanity? We must say, with a billion, over one billion Muslims and over two billion Christians, together as half the world, we have to do something about modeling what it means to live in peace, to live in harmony. We need to join together to create some kind of coalition to end stereotyping. We will never solve any of the major problems of the world until you involve houses of faith, mosques, temples, synagogues, churches, and so forth. There are 600,000 Buddhists in the world. There are 800,000 Hindus in the world. There are over a billion Muslims, a couple billion Christians. Most of the world has some kind of faith. How can a Christian make such a statement? What Rick Warren is saying is that Christians need to join together with those who reject Christ in order to solve the world's problems. Jesus also said, Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Recently, an article from the Orange County Register was published entitled, Rick Warren Builds Bridge to Muslims. It described how Warren is part of an effort named King's Way that is attempting to bring evangelical Christians and Muslims together. The Reverend Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church in Lake Forest and one of America's most influential Christian leaders, has embarked on an effort to heal divisions between evangelical Christians and Muslims by partnering with Southern California mosques and proposing a set of theological principles that includes acknowledging that Christians and Muslims worship the same God. The news went viral on the web when many bloggers and critics of Warren responded. In anticipation of a second article from the Orange County Register, Saddleback offered a preemptive strike in Warren's defense in which Warren stated, A week ago a reporter published an article in the Orange County Register about Saddleback Church that contained many errors and false assumptions. It erroneously stated that we have a partnership with a local Muslim mosque. That is false. However, the second OCR article confirms that Saddleback did indeed partner with a local Muslim mosque. In a February 10th interview with the Register, Tom Holliday, associate senior pastor at Saddleback, described the outreach to Muslims as a multi-pronged effort that includes sharing meals at mosques during religious holidays and working together with Muslims on joint community service projects. Warren continued, it erroneously reported that our church had agreed to a theological document with Muslims. The document, titled King's Way, co-authored by Abraham Muhlenberg, a Saddleback pastor in charge of interfaith outreach, and Jihad Turk, director of religious affairs of the Islamic Center of Southern California, was presented at a December dinner at Saddleback attended by 300 Christians and Muslims. The Islamic Center of Southern California, the website for Turk's mosque, published a blog post entitled ICSC co-authors historic interfaith document that demonstrates the new theological position of Saddleback. It featured a photo of Turk and Muhlenberg addressing the Saddleback audience beneath a projection on a screen with the heading King's Way. Saddleback has affirmed that the photograph was taken at Saddleback, more specifically the Saddleback Peace Center. The projected slide says King's Way, King's Way describes a path to end the 1400 years of misunderstanding between Muslims and Christians by consulting the texts we each call sacred to form a basis that allows us the privilege to serve the needs of our community together. Nevertheless, Warren went on in his defense stating, It erroneously reported that we had agreed to not evangelize with Muslims. That is false. 
However, the second Orange County Register article notes, Tom Holliday, Associate Senior Pastor at Saddleback, said the purpose of the effort was not to convert Muslims, but rather to work together to serve the community. Asked if the effort was done with Warren's knowledge and approval, Holliday replied, Of course it has his approval. The very definition of partnership is working together, and this is what Saddleback is doing with Muslims to serve the community. The Bible says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Amos 3.3 3 says, Can two walk together unless they are agreed? Jihad Turk, Kingsway co-author, had emphasized that Muslims agreed to participate in the Saddleback outreach effort because members of both faiths agreed our purpose is not to convert one another, but rather to work on ways to make the world a better place by breaking down walls of misunderstanding. The testimonies do not match up with that of Rick Warren's. Warren continues, It erroneously reported that we believe Saddleback and Muslims worship the same God. That is false. A person attending the King's Way meeting could easily have come to the conclusion that Muslims and Christians worship the same God based on the vague language of the document itself, saying, We believe in one God. God is one, and God is the Creator. With support for each of these claims from the Bible and the Quran, David Sean, Warren's chief of staff, told Jim Hinch in a register editor that the story was factually correct except in its statement that Warren believes Christians and Muslims worship the same God. Rather, Sean said that it would be more accurate to state that Christians and Muslims both believe in one God. Apparently, Sean asked the OCR to publish a correction to the article but later withdrew the request. Warren has stated, Neither I nor my staff had ever seen such a document until the article mentioned it. It wasn't created or even seen by us. Saddleback Church as a church was not involved. Obviously, David Sean, Tom Holliday, and Abraham Muhlenberg, all members of Saddleback staff, all knew about Kingsway prior to the article being published. The public statements and photographic evidence do not corroborate Warren's defense. Amy Spreeman of Stand Up for the Truth published an article entitled, Why is Saddleback Pastor Teaching on the Kingdom Circles?, which provides the context of why Jihad Turk is working with Saddleback. Saddleback Pastor Abraham Muhlenberg spoke at an event in France in June of 2012. In the diagram behind him, the Kingdom Circles are part of the session. The Kingdom Circles are a simple but highly questionable evangelical tool that people are being taught to draw in order to demonstrate how those of other faiths can enter the Kingdom of God without converting to Christianity. The Kingdom of God. Or in Arabic you could say, Malakut Allah. Now if this circle represents Christians, this circle represents Muslims, what's happened for so many years is that Christians have been telling Muslims, you've got to come over into our circle, become a Christian. That's the only way you can come into the kingdom of God. Or Muslims have been saying, hey, come over here, you've got to become a Muslim. That's how, that's how you really know God and, and are able to uh, move in the right direction. But really, those things aren't the issue. The real issue is how can we both move into the kingdom of God and find the straight path to God? That is the question. A common word between us and you is a global interfaith initiative that began as an open letter in October 2006. A common word between us and you proposes love of God and love of neighbor as the common ground between Christianity and Islam. A Christian response to the letter entitled, Loving God and Neighbor Together, a Christian response to a common word between us and you, was published in the New York Times. Some of those who endorsed the letter included megachurch pastor Bill Hybels, emergent leader Tony Jones, emergent leader Brian McLaren, self-esteem preacher Robert Schuler, and the purpose-driven pastor Rick Warren. The problem is that the document contains statements that allude to the false belief that Muslims and Christians worship the same God, that they share the same divine origin, 
the document states, It is hoped that this document will provide a common constitution for the many worthy organizations and individuals who are carrying out interfaith dialogue all over the world. Often these groups are unaware of each other and duplicate each other's efforts. Not only can a common word between us give them a starting point for cooperation and worldwide coordination, but it does so on the most solid theological ground possible, the teachings of the Quran and the Prophet, and the commandments described by Jesus Christ in the Bible. Thus, despite their differences, Islam and Christianity not only share the same divine origin and the same Abrahamic heritage, but the same two greatest commandments. Both of these documents that were written, one the Muslims wrote first, and then you have the professing Christian response, is about unification and that we can only be one if we agree that we're worshiping the same God. In the summary of a common word between us and you, it states, the basis for this peace and understanding already exists. It is part of the very foundational principles of both faiths, love of the one God. The Christian response letter also refers to God of the Muslim tradition, as if the Muslims worship the same God as Christians. While Islam claims to worship one God, the response letter does not address the profound differences between the one God of the Bible and Allah. They signed the response that Yale Divinity School put back, which included uh, affirmation that Muhammad was the prophet. Since they did not refute the statement that the Bible and the Quran are both of divine origin, they were affirming that as well. I believe it's the greatest betrayal in the history of Christianity by professing Christian leaders. And what's really just tragic about this is the Quran nine different times denies nine different times that Jesus is the Son of God. Denies it. Now how can you deny the incarnation, God in the flesh, and deny that Jesus is God and say that we have the same God? How can you deny that God is triune? Deny Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and claim that we worship the same God. You really can't. And, and Muslims recognize ultimately that uh, we have to deny the Trinity. In fact, the common word document is based on a surah, a verse in the Quran, which states emphatically to make a common word between us and them, the Christians that calls the people of the book, and get them to deny or not to say that God is three or that they're, God is triune. Now think about this. You're having Muslims write a document based upon a surah that joins them to go to Christians to get them to deny that Jesus is God in the flesh, to deny the Trinity, to make a common word based on that surah. They call it a common word between us and you. Christians, professing Christians, write back, like Rick Warren and Brian McLaren, sign and agree that, hey, yeah, we all worship the same God, you know, i.e. loving God and neighbor together, meaning we're loving the same God. Therefore, we can hope to have world peace. And it's compromised in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Though Christians may be in agreement with Muslims about finding common ground and not desiring strife, violence, and war, it is on the basis of the person of Jesus Christ that Christians do not kill. The love of God is uniquely expressed in Christ dying for our sins upon the cross and raising again which Islam rejects. The Bible is clear that whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Muslims reject Jesus as the crucified and risen Son of God and Savior of the world. Therefore Muslims are rejecting God. Christians and Muslims do not stand together on common ground or understanding of God or the love of God. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. While Jesus teaches to love one's enemies and be at peace with all men, Christians are not to set aside profound differences in the name of world peace. Any peace without Christ is futile in the scope of eternity. And we put all these things together and we realize that 1 John 2.22 identifies uh, Antichrist. And there are many Antichrists that have come and that will come again. But there's an ultimate Antichrist as well. Is a denial that spirit is a denial of the Father and the Son. And again, 
this is the movement that we're witnessing before our very eyes. And we're seeing much of Christendom being swept up into it through the purpose-driven movement, through the emerging church movement, through the seeker-sensitive movement. Nobody denies the need for social reform, but it is a shameful compromise of the Great Commission to replace the gospel with social, economic, and political reforms. Warren's noble efforts for global reformation will bring wisdom, discipline, order, health, education, and security but it will not bring life. Indeed, it will keep countless from God's kingdom by deluding them into rejoicing contentedly over a refreshing glass of old wine. They will believe they have found God, but will only have been brought closer to godly principles. There is no life in the mere influence of God, only in His presence, and that life requires death toward all that the world loves. There are many passages in the Word that clearly describe what the world's reaction will be to the Gospel and how we will be treated and regarded because of the Gospel. The nature of Rick Warren's program and message is defined by how the world reacts to it. Warren is reaching people groups with information, organization, ideas, and even inspiration. His team is doing many good works in Jesus' name. The enemy is happy to have us doing good things so long as we do them without the presence of God. We will all see on the last day who truly knows the Lord. Indeed, the church growth movement may gain the world by compromising the gospel. But Jesus said, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. One more, one more, one more, one more. Right here, right here, right here. You know, I have a million followers between Twitter and Facebook, so you just got famous just now, you guys. All right, how many of you follow, follow Taffy on Twitter? Oh, you're sinners. How many of you follow uh, Pastor Josh? <laughs> if you're not following me on Twitter, you're going to hell. Okay, I'm sorry. That's, I just want you guys to know that. So It's in the Bible there somewhere. I know. I know for sure. <laughs>